this morning, what I want to speak about is, um, I've called my message. My message is called today, Changing the Climate of a Continent or the Narrative of a Nation. And, you know, I feel like already this has been a little bit of the theme that we have spoken around. And um, I find that intriguing, like, you know, the journey God takes us on. And last year, I felt it was quite equipping for the church. But this year, I feel like it's a bit of a different, um, God is doing something different. And this is what I want to bring today. I guess I feel it's prophetic. (laughs) Hopefully not pathetic, but prophetic. And um, I believe that this is what God would want to say to us today. And so my message is called Changing the Climate of a Continent and the Narrative of a Nation. Do you know the word climate? The word climate, it actually is this. It's a prevailing trend. It's a prevailing trend, okay? It's the atmosphere. Look at this, everyone. It's the atmosphere. It's the mood. It's the temper. It's the spirit. It's the feel. It's the ambience. It's the tenor, it's the tendency, it's the essence, it's the ethos, and it's the attitude. And I believe with all of my heart that the Church of Jesus Christ is called to change the climate, the climate, the prevailing trend of our continent, and I believe the Church of Jesus Christ is called to change the narrative of this nation. Do you know in a weather, in, um, in a climate, you might have different weather patterns. You might in summer... You might have a a day of rain, and in winter, you might have a day of sun, and that is exactly what life is like. You might be in a summer season, but you may have a day of winter, or you might be in a winter season, and you may have a day of sun. I'm not talking about weather. I'm talking about the prevailing, prevailing climate of a continent and the narrative of a nation. I believe it is dependent upon this room and how we outwork what we are hearing from today. See, I am crazy. I am crazy enough to believe this. I am crazy enough to believe that we are called to change the spiritual climate of a nation. I believe that we are called to change the economic climate of a nation. I believe that we are called to change the medical climate of a nation. I believe that we can change the educational climate of a nation, and I believe that we can change the social climate of a nation. And you might say, how are we going to do that? How we are going to do that is by the church of Jesus Christ and the people of God and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is how we're going to do this. We are going to change the spiritual climate, the economic climate, the medical climate, the educational climate, and the social climate. If you believe that, can you please say one big, Amen. Because in Isaiah 55 and verse 9, it says this, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So if this is the truth, why can't we, the church, change the climate of a continent and the narrative of a nation in Jesus' name? (laughs) I believe it. I haven't moved over here the other side of the world to just have a nice cup of tea and a coffee and an occasional good meal. I've come here for something greater than myself, something that is impossible without the Lord Jesus. And I say if people are leaving to go to a comfortable, easygoing country where they don't need God, well, good on them. But God has positioned us here for such a time as this. And we will never change Africa. We can never change the continent without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I am expectant. I want to talk to you about five people who changed the climate of a continent. Five people who did this. Obviously, the Bible is full of people who did this. But five today, I'm going to draw your attention to. The first person I want to draw your attention to, her name is Dorcas. Unfortunate name, but hey, (laughs) she changed the climate of a continent. (laughs) Dorcas, look, what a legend. We read about her in Acts chapter 9. Let's read this together. Now, there was a follower of Jesus who lived in Joppa. Joppa is actually um, the olden day Tel Aviv. That's what it was. And her Arabic name was Tabitha, which means gazelle. And just remember, he makes our feet like a hind feet, like a deer, like we can climb the highest mountains. It actually means that we can go to the greatest battles. 
That's what it means. She lived her life doing kind things for others and serving the poor. (laughs) Okay, how awesome. She lived her life doing kind things for others and serving the poor. But then she became very ill and she died. After the disciples prepared her body for burial, they laid her in an upstairs room. When the believers heard that Peter was nearby in Lydia, they sent two men with an urgent message for him to come without delay. So Peter went with them back to Joppa. After arriving, he led him to the upper room. And there were many widows standing next to Peter, weeping. One after another showed him the tunics and the other garments that Tabitha had made to bless others. Peter made them all leave the room, and then he knelt down and he prayed. Turning to the dead body, he said, Tabitha, rise up. And at once she opened her eyes. Seeing Peter, she sat up. She took her, he took her by the hand. He helped her to her feet. And then he called for the believers and all the widows to come and see that she was alive. And then the news spread all over the city of Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Uh, but Peter remained in Joppa for several more days at the, as a guest in the house of Simon the tenor. I want to show you four things about this lady, Dorcas. I want to show you about her life. I want to show you about her loss. I want to show you about her Lord. And I want to show you about her legacy. Because her life was this. She was always doing good and helping the poor. And her loss was unacceptable because she was always doing good and helping the poor. And then her Lord, she was the first woman ever in the Bible to be called a disciple. So she was recognized as someone very esteemed in the eyes of God. And then her legacy lives on even till today. They have set up right across the country what they call Dorcas Institutes. The Dorcas Institutes are there to help clothe and look after the poor. So this woman, Dorcas, actually changed the climate of a continent. How did she change the climate of the continent? By actually looking after the poor. And you know what? I pray that this will be the example that you and I set in our churches, that our life would always be about the poor and about others, that our loss, our loss would become unacceptable. I hope if I pass away, you go and you find two people like Peter or one person like Peter, put everyone out of the room and raise me from the dead because I would like my life to be unacceptable loss. And then her Lord was Jesus Christ. And then her legacy lives on. So at the art conference in George in 2019, you're still hearing about Dorcas, a lady back in Tel Aviv who decided I'm going to reach out and I'm going to help people that are less fortunate than myself. Come on, church. That's how you change the climate of a continent. In Jesus' name. The second person I want to talk to you about who changed the climate of a continent, and his name was Ezra. Now, Ezra was, um, Ezra was a scribe, and Ezra was a prophet. So he was sent to speak the word of the Lord, and he was sp- sent to prophesy the word of the Lord. And the nation of Israel was God's chosen special people. But what had happened, that they had turned away from God, and they had got caught up in um, sin and um, destruction. And then God said, okay, Ezra, you need to go and you need to be, um, speak the word of the Lord and rescue this land. Do you get me? I'm going to read to you Ezra chapter 9 and verse 10 and 11. Look at this. But now our God, this is Ezra, what can we say after this? For the, he's praying out on behalf, interceding on behalf of the land. For we have forsaken the commands that you gave through your servants and the prophets when you said, the land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by corruption of its people. Does that sound like any other land? Can you see that? The land was polluted by corruption. So when you hear people say there's so much corruption, don't don't panic. It was also in the day here. It was polluted with corruption by the detestable practices. Is there any detestable practices in our country? Corruption, detestable, detestable practices. And they filled it um, with their impurity from one end to the other. Wow, hectic. Okay, now I want to show you. We're going to go on to chapter 10. Have a look at this. Now get this. While Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God. 
A large crowd of Israelites, men, women and children, gathered around him. They too wept bitterly. And then Shekinah, son of Jehel, who was actually one of the corrupt, corrupt people... So Ezra had been crying, he'd been weeping bitterly, he'd been feeling the pain of a nation, of a continent, he'd been carrying that burden before God, and a man cottons on, and he says, the son of Jehel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, we have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the people around us. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Come on. There is still hope for Israel. Do you know what? Back in the day, these were God's people. I believe today Africa is God's chosen continent. He loves this continent. He absolutely loves it. He has a plan and he has a purpose for this continent. And it may have got a bit caught up in corruption. And it may They have had some detestable acts. But I believe, church, if we can do what Ezra did, he got down on his knees and he wept before his God and he carried the burden of a nation. He carried the burden of a continent. And he said, I'm going to stand in the gap for my nation and I'm going to stand in the gap for my continent. And do you know what? Then what happened is they started to speak hope. And I believe, church, with all of my heart, if you're going to change the climate of a continent and the narrative of a nation, you've got to look after the poor and then you've got to get down on our knees and we've got to feel the burden. We've got to feel the burden of what happens across this land and we've got to decide that we're going to speak hope. We're not going to speak words of death and defeat. We're going to open our mouth and we're going to declare the goodness of God. And as we declare the goodness of God, we are going to defy the enemy. It is very important that we understand as church leaders, we're not going to do this with another pull out of a pull out of a bag sermon. We've got to get down on our knees. We've got to call upon the name of the Lord. We've got to bind the spirit of darkness. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And that's the church of Jesus Christ. And so I just want to encourage us that if we're going to change the um, climate of a continent... I believe with all of my heart, we've got to speak hope and we've got to get down on our knees before God. The third person I want to talk to you about who changed the climate of a continent and his name was Nehemiah. Nehemiah, we know Nehemiah. I'll just tell you a little bit about him. Nehemiah, what did he do in um, in Nehemiah chapter one? Look at this, the words of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. In the month of Kislev, the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Haniah, one of the brothers came from Judah with some of the other men. I questioned about Jewish remnant and survived exile and Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and they're in great disgrace. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. What, what's the ingredient? He sat down and he prayed and he wept and, he, um, and he, he actually got the heart of God for a nation. He got the heart of God for a situation and he allowed God to move, to move him. And then you go on to the next scripture in chapter 4 verse 12. Look at this. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles and the officials, I looked things over and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and who is awesome and fight for your families and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. And I believe, church, it's time to remember to be building on one side, but to pick up your weapons of war on the other side and fight for your sisters and fight for your brothers and fight for your churches and fight for your families families and fight for the broken and fight for the dying and fight for the hurting because that is the job of the church. So Nehemiah, he prayed, he was moved, but then he picked up his weapons of war and he decided to fight. And do you know, I believe you change a continent, not just by your prayer, but by your weapons. If you have the word of God in one hand, you have prayer in the other hand, you rally the army, you stay unified as a team, you love one another, you count the cost, you sacrifice your life, and then we can change the narrative of a nation. (laughs) 
The next man, the next person who changed the narrative, the, co- the climate of a continent, the narrative of a nation, his name was Caleb. I love Caleb. Moses said, okay, 12 of you, 12 of you mighty men, I want you to go into all of Africa, and I want you to give me a report back on what you see. And we know how the story goes. All 12 came back. But the devastating part of the story is 10 of them never made it into where God was taking them. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what he was trying to say. Come with me. I'm taking you into the promised land. What is the promised land? Well, the promised land is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the promised land. And so he's saying, come on, let's go. All 10 of them brought a a different report. All 10 of them said, sorry, we can't do it. There's giants in the land. Sorry, it's a bountiful country, but there's no way they're stronger than I. They're stronger than we are. We're never going to conquer it. There's too much corruption. There's too much rape. There's too much violence. There's too much evil. There's too much stuff going on. But, everybody say but. No, say but. But. But there was this one man, and his name was Caleb. Caleb had a different spirit about him. Caleb saw something different. It all depends what you see. If you can see only the problem, you'll only see the problem. But if you can see past the problem and see the possibility, then God can do anything you know. So look at this one verse. I'll read to you Numbers 13, and I'll read verse 30. It says this, but Caleb silenced the people. Everybody say silenced. The people before Moses. And he said, we should go up and take possession. Everyone say take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Can you say certainly do it? What was it about Caleb? Caleb had these three things. Caleb, he he had a huge courage because he had to silence any other voice. If you are going to change the climate of a continent, you've got to silence any other voice that would tell you otherwise. Then the second thing about him is he had this crazy faith because he says, man, we, let's go. We're going to go at once. We're going to do this thing. He had this crazy faith. And then the third thing about him is he had a huge, huge amount of confidence. He goes, we, we're not just going to go. We're going to conquer it. And do you know what? I believe with all my heart, if we're going to change the climate of a continent, the narrative of a nation, we actually have to have huge courage. We have to have crazy faith. And we have to say, man, I'm taking my confidence with me. It is like, do not cast away your confidence because it has great reward. It's not somebody else's confidence. It's your confidence. Don't give it away because we're changing the climate of a continent and the narrative of a nation. And my final person I want to talk to you about. I can slow down now. (laughs) The final person I want to talk to you about, he changed the climate of a continent, narrative of a nation. His name was Gideon. And I love Gideon. I relate so well to Gideon. And I I feel like him at times. And if you look at the story in Judges chapter 6, look at this. The angel of the Lord came and he sat down under the oak. The angel of the Lord came. And he sat down under the oak of Oprah. Oprah was in the Bible. She's been here a long time. That belonged to Joash, the Abazite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in in the wine press to keep it from the Midianites. He didn't want anyone to see what he was doing because he needed what was he needed the food and the stuff he was doing, you know? When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And then Gideon, look what Gideon says. Oh, pardon me, Lord. No, okay, so the angel appears. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And he says, Oh no, sorry, pardon me, Lord. Pardon me, Lord, you've got the wrong person. I'm not sure you know what you're doing. Pardon me, Lord. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, okay, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of slavery? And now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the land of the Midianite. And the Lord turned to him again and said, go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. I am, am I not sending you? And again, he goes, oh, pardon me, Lord. <laughs> okay, I love him. Pardon me, Lord. Do you know what I realized reading this story? I realized 
that the future of a nation was trapped in the argument of Gideon's mind. And do you know, I believe for us, the future of our nation, the climate of our continent is maybe trapped in our thinking, in the processes of what's up in here. If we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, if we serve the one who raises the dead and heals the sick, if we serve the one who puts a baby in a virgin, if we serve the one who says, man, I will protect you, Elohim, um, what, is, uh, um, what is that song? <laughs> what is that song, Elohim? How does it go? Uh, maker of the earth. Lord of... <laughs> Almighty God. Maker of the earth, he is the Lord of kings, heaven's king. Yes! Okay! I'm, so, I'm just taking my amazing worship leading anointing to a whole other level up here. It's a special talent. But look at Gideon, the future... The future of the nation was trapped in the argument of Gideon's mind. And I pray in here today, I pray, this is what I pray, that God can get his hands across your mind, and he can say, okay, come on, I'm doing something different, I'm doing something new, I'm going to use you now like I've never used you before, I'm going to like catapult you into the future, it's like I see him pulling back this arrow and letting you go, and you're going to build churches, and you're going to change the land, and you're going to raise up leaders, and you're going to do what you've never done before, and you're going to change the history of this nation and the continent in Jesus' name, I believe that, so let's have a look, let's remind ourselves, Dorcas, what did she do? She actually looked after the poor. So let's look after the poor and needy. Ezra, what did he do? He actually got down on his knees. He wept. He felt the pain of a nation and a continent. And then he spoke hope over it. Nehemiah, what did he do? He got down and he wept and he carried the burden of a nation. He interceded for something that he was out of his control. And then he said, now we will fight for our brothers and our sisters and our nation and our land. And then you look at Caleb. What did Caleb do? He silenced the voices. He took possession and he never lost his confidence. He had courage. He had crazy faith. He had confidence. Come on, everybody. And then you've got Gideon. And Gideon, the, the future of the nation was trapped in his mind. But you know what? Pardon me, God. Pardon me, God. God finally got a hold of him and he became obedient to the plan and the purpose of God. So I want to say to you this, how do we actually do this? I've given you some keys, but four things, four Ds. Are you ready for the four Ds? I think the four Ds, number one, if we're really going to do this and accomplish this together, I think number one comes down to desire. Do you know, at 14 years of age, I found Jesus Christ. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in my bathroom. I started to pray in tongues. I started to speak in my heavenly prayer language. And a new boldness came upon me and a new fire and a new faith came upon me. And do you know what? Then the mission of our life, the mission, I, began, I got a mission and I got a mandate and I got a meditation. And my mission became this. It's in Psalm 63. It says, it says, oh God of my life, I'm lovesick for you in this weary wilderness. I thirst with the deepest longings to love you more, with cravings in my heart that cannot be described. Such yearning grips my soul for you, my God. I'm energized every time I enter your heavenly sanctuary to seek more of your power and drink in more of your glory. I pray, church, that this actually becomes our mission. The first and foremost, our greatest passion and our greatest desire is for Jesus Christ. If that becomes our desire, I think something powerful can happen. So that became my mission. But then I got a mandate. <laughs> I used to go on every altar call. I would go on altar calls for depression. I would go on altar calls for suicide. I would go on altar calls for um, just to serve the Lord. I would go on altar calls to get set free. I just went on anything. Why did I go on it? You're looking at me like confused. <laughs> She's a very strange girl. I was a very strange girl. But I just wanted more of God. So I would always find myself down here. And then the mission became Psalm 2. The mandate, and the mandate of Psalm 2 is this, 
How dare the nations plan a rebellion? Their foolish plots are futile. Look at how the power brokers of the world rise up to hold their summit. As the rulers scheme to confirm together against Yahweh and his anointed king saying, let's come together and break away from the creator. I mean, they're crazy. Once and for all, let's cast off these controlling chains of God and his Christ. I mean, this was absolute rebellion. God enthroned merely laughs at them. The sovereign one, the sovereign one mocks their madness. And then with fierce, fierceness and fi fiery anger, he settles the issue and terrifies them to death with these words. I myself will put out the King of Zion, the church of Jesus Christ, my holy mountain. I will reveal the eternal purposes of God, for he has decreed over me. You are my favorite son, and as a father, I've crowned you the King of Eternal. Today I become your father. And then he says, ask, can we read this together? One, two, three. Ask me to give you the nations and I will do it and they shall become your legacy. Your domain will stretch to the ends of the earth and you will shepherd them with unlimited authority, crushing their rebellion as an iron smashes jars of clay. Come on. Do you know what? We would go on these altar calls and we would stand there and say, God, give us the nations of this earth. God, send us places we never imagined. God, take us places we never thought we could go. God, use us in areas that we never thought was possible. And now I find myself in Africa. I think God heard my prayers as a 14-year-old girl. And he said, okay, church, he wants to remind us again today, what is it you desire? Can we desire him above all? And can we ask him for the nations? There's 58 nations and continent and um, countries in Africa. Can we ask him for all 58? Can we be wild and crazy? And can we put our trust in God? Because he says in Psalm 20, if you pray prayers like this, he says, I will give you the desires of your heart. I will respond to what you're asking. And I pray that we will be have this mission and have this mandate and the meditation knowing that he will give it to us as he has promised because his promises will never return void. They are yes and they are amen and they are for us forever. But we've got to get back to desiring God to use us in such great and magnificent ways. It's out of our league, I know. It's out of our control, I know. But how good is that? Because then you're no longer, I'm a control freak by nature, but now I'm no longer in control because it's way out of my control. <laughs> got to desire it. Number two, you've got to decide. You've got to decide. You've got to desire it, and then we've got to decide. Do you know, because Galatians 2, verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. Okay, is that the truth? I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is no longer I who lives. This became, as a, as a child, this became my, my story. And I used to say this scripture, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who lives. I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who lives. If it's no longer you who lives, you will go to places. You will go to dark places. You will go to unreached places. You will go to any places if God calls you there. Because as one of our speakers has already said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And I pray that that will be the story of our church, that we will understand that we make this decision again to sacrifice ourselves and to die every single day. You get your, your spiritual knife, not your real knife, your spiritual knife, and you put it through your chest and you remember to say, I die daily and it's no longer who I who lives, but Christ who lives in me, in Jesus' name. And then number three, how do we do this? Well, number one, we desire it. Number two, we decide it. And number three, we discipline ourselves. And we've already heard this so profoundly spoken about, but I do find it intriguing that in Acts chapter two, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter four, they needed to get refilled. That's two chapters later. Because I think once you get filled, you're not filled forever. You've got to stop and you've got to get refilled. And you've got to allow God to pour in. That's why he says in 2 Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God that is within you. You've got to keep that little spark burning. You've got to never let that fire of God in your heart burn out. You've got to keep it alive. How do you keep it alive? You keep saying, God, even if you're not hungry, you say, God, make me hungry again. If you're not desperate, God, make me desperate again. If you don't care, God, help me to care. God, I want to have your heart. I want to carry your heart. Because I think he wants us to discipline ourselves, discipline ourselves to go after him with everything and keep the, keep the, keep the fire burning in our heart. And do you know, um, I, can I say this, that 
the, my po- I posture, because I'm learning this posture this year, if God had a rope and he could pull it in like this, the posture I think he's pulling me into is stillness and silence. Because I think if you just all be very quiet in this room, close your eyes. Do you know the power of the, the loudness of silence is amazing? What you hear in silence is amazing. And I don't think you can truly know the depths of God if you don't know how to be silent. I fail it all the time. I'm, I would say I'm a failure in this area. But I'm trying to resurrect myself and be still and be silent. So we're going to desire it. We're going to decide it. We're going to discipline ourselves. And then we're going to stay determined. We're going to stay determined. And may I read you this most inspiring, inspiring, inspiring passage. You're going to love it. You're going to fall on, your, on the ground. Are these super apostles of yours Hebrews? Well, I am too. Are they Israelites? Well, so am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? Me too. Are they servants of the anointed one? I'm beside myself. I'm beside myself when I speak this way. But I am much more a servant than they. I have worked much harder for God, taken more beatings and been dragged to more prisons than they. I've been flogged excessively, multiple times, even to the point of death. Five times I've received 39 lashes from the Jewish leaders. Three times I've experienced being beaten with rods. Once they stoned me three times I've been shipwrecked for an entire night three um for an entire night and a day I was adrift in open sea in my difficult travels I've faced many dangerous situations and perilous rivers and robbers and foreigners and even my own people I've survived deadly peril in the city in the wilderness with storms at sea and with spies posing as believers I've toiled to the point of exhaustion and gone through many sleepless nights I've frequently been deprived of food and water left hungry and shivering out in the cold lacking proper clothing And besides the painful circumstances, I've had the daily pressure and responsibility of the churches with a deep concern weighing heavily on my heart for their welfare. I am not aloof for who who is desperate and weak. I do not feel um, their weakness. I I am not aloof for, for... I am not aloof for who is desperate and weak, and I do, not feel, I do not feel their weakness. Who is led astray into sin? I do not burn with zeal to restore... Who is led astray... Like, Amen. And besides these painful circumstances, I have the daily pressure and responsibility of all the churches. Do you know when I read about Paul, I see he was a true pioneer. And because he pioneered hell and high water, I don't think we have to pioneer the same thing. I think he did a lot of that for us. But wherever he takes us, wherever his journey actually leads us, whatever that might look like for you, I pray that we will actually stay determined in the race, that I will be poured out as a drink offering. And at the end of the day, I will know that I can stand. And he will look back at me and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant of the Lord. Stay desiring, keep deciding, stay disciplined and remain determined. And do know, I want to say this, two seconds left. These are the enemies to that. These are the enemies. Put them in your notes. You can get tired. And if you get tired, I want to say to you, it's okay. All you've got to do is rest, revive and restore. Because Psalm 23 says he'll lead you beside still waters. The second enemy to this is compromise and complacency. And I want to ask you to remove the troubling foxes because they're going to destroy your intimacy. Then I want to say the third enemy is your priorities. And all you need to do is realign. And the fourth enemy is sin. And all sin does is separate you. So you just got to turn and go the other way. Repent for your sin and turn back to God. Another enemy is our disappointment. But can I encourage you to keep trusting because he will be faithful because he's a good, good father. And the, thir- and the final enemy is striving. And could I encourage you to enter his grace? If you're tired and worn out on religion, take a rest, take a real break. Learn the rhythms, the unforced rhythms of grace and you'll be able to step into what he has for you. And I pray that we will be the church of Jesus Christ that changes the climate of a continent and the narrative of a nation. In Jesus' name, can we stand together? I would like us to read something. I'm going to go now. I'm going to go off the stage. I'm going to go off the stage, but I want you to read this. I want you to read this out loud with me, and then we'll turn this into a prayer meeting for 60 seconds. Are you ready? We're going to read from Song of Solomon. 
It's not about romance, guys. It's about the church. Song of Solomon. Okay, you're ready to read this together. The first part is the bride, the church. The second part is what God says to us. Are you ready? One, two, three. I've made up my mind until the darkness disappears and the dawn has fully come. In spite of shadows and fears, I will go to the mountaintop with you, the mountain of suffering love and the hill of burning incense. Yes, I will be your bride. Every part of you is so beautiful, my darling. Perfect is your beauty without flaw within. Now you are ready, my bride, to come with me as we climb the highest peaks together. Come with me through the archway of trust and we will look down from the crest of bristling mounts and the summit of our sublime sanctuary. And together, we will wage war in the lion's den and the leopard's lair. In Jesus' name, come on, let's go. We're gonna wage war. We're gonna wage war. And we're gonna change a 